Hey friends, thanks for joining us as we continue our series on stewardship called Home Improvement. And uh, this week we're going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Let's read verse 3 to get started. Here now, this is God's word. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, I know that our old nature is very strong. And I pray, God, that as we study your word today, that you would reveal to us how you're making us into a new person. And I pray, Lord, that the awareness that we have of who we used to be would stir us and shock us and reveal to us, Lord, uh, how you are going to, through your power, make us into new people. We want this, Lord, and we invite you to do that now as we study your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, last week, I reminisced back to the hit 90s TV show, Home Improvement, which shows the life of a fictional family man and DIY show host, Tim the Toolman Taylor. And in one episode, Tim went out of his way to do something really nice for his wife, Jill, by remodeling their home to have the latest and greatest gadgets. And one thing he did was he upgraded their walk-in master bedroom closet to have remote control entry, premium vanity mirrors, rotating hangers for her dresses, and even a turntable display for her shoe collection. And just as Jill was about to throw her arms around Tim and thank him because she loved it, Tim unveiled the final and most important feature of this new uh, state-of-the-art <laughs> closet, which was a security system that set off a loud alarm and flashing red lights and a voice <laughs> saying alert every time Jill put one of her belongings on Tim's side of the closet. And suddenly the value of this amazing work of art, this piece de resistance, was lost. Because what happened was we discovered that the real effort, the real push, the drive behind Tim was not just to meet the needs of his wife, but it was really actually a very selfishly motivated project. He really wanted to prove to his wife that he was in control of the closet uh, and that where she put her belongings and things like that was bothering him. And it just blew the whole thing to bits, really, uh, relationally speaking. And, you know, it's amazing because we can do a lot of good things for one another and, and it'll good, do a lot of good things in the world. But it's actually what's underneath that. It's, it's actually the motive. It's the, the will. It's the drive uh, to the core of who we are. That really matters. And it's really, that's what gives it the most value. You know, it seems like it's getting harder and harder to find firm foundations today. You know, everything seems to be so polished. You know, you could find a lot of state-of-the-art, modern-looking homes with bells and whistles. But, you know, if that house is resting in a floodplain or on top of a, a toxic waste dump, well, <laughs> is it really worth it to live there? And the same principle applies to our churches and our families and our communities. Many secular, or I'm sorry, many families and churches actually look impressive on the outside. And we can really fill our schedules with all kinds of things, activities, nice clothes, decorations. We can celebrate in wonderful ways. But you know what? Underneath this sparkling facade, there's a lot of groups of people out there that are very st much struggling with unresolved conflict. There's a sense of contentiousness, unforgiveness, and bitterness in our whole nation. And it's eroding at the foundations of what, what we can come together on. And some people are wondering, well, just how much more conflict can we take before things really start come crashing down? The Bible teaches us that the foundations of healthy relationships, of a healthy home, are built upon a mindset of humility. In Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, we read this earlier, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. This is really hard to do. In fact, you know, maybe some psychologists would argue that 
It's almost impossible for a, a human being without God's help to actually really be motivated for the sake of God and for others, because we are so hardwired to think about ourselves all the time. But actually, what's amazing here is that the key for having healthy friendships, healthy relationships, healthy churches, and, and the peace that comes with that is actually when we learn to empty ourselves uh, and we begin to have a submissive mindset, a mindset that is entirely focused upon uh, the goodwill of God and others. You know, it's a rare and wonderful thing to have one person around you who genuinely is more concerned for your well-being than they are for their own. And can you imagine having a whole home and a whole community around you of people who function like that, who are constantly considerate of other people's needs uh, when they go through their day? They, it's not that they think less of themselves, it's just that they think of themselves less. And I think that was C.S. Lewis who coined that phrase. It's so true. So how does this look? Well, Paul gives us four examples right here in this chapter of Philippians 2. Here we go on in verse 5. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Other translations say grasped or held on to for his own good. Rather, Christ made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the, for, the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death itself, even death on a cross, the worst kind. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and he gave him the name that's above every name, and that at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus, who, who had it all and had a right to think about himself first, decided actually to think outwardly. And this is why we know God is love. Um, he left his comfort, his glory in heaven. He came down and he walked in our challenges. And he veiled that glory for a time. So much that people who didn't know him even despised him when they saw him. And he ultimately died in our place, paying the price for our sins. And this was all done for us to grant us the opportunity to switch places with him in terms of the justice of God. That God would pour out upon Jesus his wrath for our sins, that we might be, through him, uh, washed clean. You know, John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You know, we take Jesus at his word because he backed it up with action. To lay down your life. For friends, how do we do that? Well, some people could say that you know, being a martyr is to go to an early grave for a higher cause. But I think Jesus is talking about actually a daily act of 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 submission and of selflessness. This is, I, in my opinion, I think quite a bit more difficult. It, it's one thing for a moment to die painfully; it's another thing to live. Uh, for the sake of others and for your entire life. But you know what? There is something amazing about having this mindset because when we learn to truly serve others like, like Jesus did, uh, to live with this posture of lifting up God and others first, friends, it actually brings out the very best of who we are. It actually reveals to us the joy of life itself. And this is what Jesus was longing to give us when he talked about this abundant life. It's actually a life of servitude, joyful servitude, because we have received this service from Christ first. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned its shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is really amazing that Jesus did this. He experienced a sense of joy in the midst of his suffering, not because he enjoyed suffering, but because he was on a mission to make a path for us that we couldn't make for ourselves, It was the joy for him to see us escape from suffering, 
to be lifted up out of you know the, the wrath of God and into uh, the arms of our Heavenly Father as children of God. Uh, you know, the, the joy that we can have is, is the joy of seeing people lifted out of the pits of their lives. When we get a chance to be a part of that, friends, it's exhilarating. It's thrilling. And we're drawn to examples of it wherever we go. There's no greater example of joy than when we see from the loving service of Jesus himself. Jesus is it. I'm so grateful that Jesus served me this way. But you might be thinking, well, how can I do that? Because, you know, Jesus, he was a human being, but he was also God. Well, Paul keeps going and he gives several more examples himself, for starters. In verse 12 through 13, he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It, for it's God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Wow, this is so critical for Paul. To have Christ in order to have his joyful mind. We, we, have, we can't have one without the other. We have, we have to have Christ in order to have his attitude of submission and joy that comes with it. So the first step we have to, to do is to actually literally receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior and to have a relationship with him and to tap into his joy uh, out of servitude. Um, and what happens when we connect with Jesus in this faith relationship and we, we pour ourselves out to him, it says that he, God works in us to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This means that we have to submit ourselves, every aspect of ourselves, to God, and then the Holy Spirit will flow through us. Well, how, do we, how can we do this? Well, one way is we could submit our words. Philippians 2, verse 14, Paul goes on to say, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and, and pure, children of God without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. And then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Wow. So when we submit to Jesus our words, and we use our words to actually lift up others and not tear them down, that is when our heart, which desires what's best for them, matches our words. And then out of that, uh, out of our mouths, we get the ability to build up and encourage one another. I'll tell you, your words are so powerful. They have a power of life and death in the power of the tongue, as the Bible says. Jesus said in Luke 6.45, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And so Paul's own example, as he found, as we see this in his letters, reveals Paul's words. And his words are filled with encouragement and grace and love, but also discipline and focus for the church. Why? Because his, church, his focus was, was not to keep the relationship he had with them, you know, always warm and fuzzy and happy, but to actually focus on what was best for them and to use his words to try to exhort and to challenge them and to call them into a deeper understanding of Christ. And so here's Paul he has a two-year sentence as a prisoner in a Roman home. And, you know, he's not complaining. <laughs> he's not speaking ill of anyone. Uh, not even his jailers. Why? Because while he's in this mindset, he's in this prison, he's realizing that as he submitted to God's will, he was actually more free than he'd ever been in his entire life. And as Paul was interrogated by Roman rulers, they were amazed at his clarity of mind and persuasive speech. Even when Paul's life was on the line, his concern was always for others. And God used him to be a light to the Christians around the world for 2,000 years after that, and even to me as well. In verse 16, Paul says of Philippians 2, But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad, and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Wow. So the submissive mind of Paul led him to actually joyful servitude. It was joyful for him to think about others and God first. The next, the next example that Paul gives us is the submissive mind of Timothy. In verse 19 of Philippians 2, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, 
that I also may be cheered when I receive good news about or receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone who looks out for their own interests, not for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. So Timothy's an example of someone who did this. He submitted his interests to Jesus and accepted Christ's interest instead. And how did he do this? He showed a genuine concern for the welfare of the Christians in Philippi. This is really the hallmark of what a true Christian is like. When we step out and we think about others and we try to consider what others need, and we don't take things personally when people say or do things around us, but instead we're always focused on building up and, and strengthening and encouraging. What happens? The world is shocked. The world is surprised. Uh, you know, people, the, the natural default setting of us, unless God changes us, is what about me? What about my comfort, my education, my career, my dreams? But Timothy wasn't like that. His focus was always upon the needs of others. In Philippians 2.22, he says, But you know that Timothy has proved himself as a son with his father. He has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I know how things go with me, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So Timothy proved himself to be a suitable protege of Paul. You know, we can read more about Paul uh, in his letters to Timothy. We see that Timothy was a very gifted pastor and a preacher. And he became really highly esteemed as a great leader in the church. But interestingly, he didn't let that go to his head. Uh, it's no wonder that Paul sought to send Timothy to those in Philippi. Because he wanted the best encourager he had. Uh, and Timothy was it. And Because they were experiencing incredible hardships uh, under the Romans themselves. You know, I could go on and on about Timothy. But there's one more person that Paul expresses in this letter. And I want to turn to him next which is uh, the, the, um, the person of Epaphroditus. It's in verse 25. But I think it's necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to care of my needs, to take care of my needs. So where was, what were Paul's needs as a prisoner? Well, he couldn't work. So he had no money. Uh, you can't use that to, to buy food or clothing or his daily needs. And Paul was literally chained to a Roman guard. So he couldn't leave the house. He couldn't necessarily socialize or have fun or enjoy life as a, as a free person could. Now add to the fact that Paul was waiting to hear his sentencing. Uh, you know, whether or not he would be released or have his head cut off for his faith. I imagine it was a very lonely and fearful existence for him. And the Christians in Philippi felt a great concern for Paul, so they took what little financial resources they had themselves, and they sent a gift of money to Paul through a man named Epaphroditus. The amazing thing is we really don't know hardly anything about this man, and yet he's included in the list of people who experienced the joy of a submissive mind. The name Epaphroditus is Greek. It means favorite of, of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. This meant that he was raised in a pagan home, and he probably converted to Christianity later on in his life, probably after hearing Paul preach. And so the Philippians chose him to be their delegate because he probably was a very extre extremely brave man and he wanted to serve. And we know this because of the many titles that Paul attributed to him in verse 25. The first he says, he calls him my brother. Paul felt a personal affection for Epaphroditus. Not just the brothers in a general sense, but brothers in faith, brothers of heart. They were the same as family because they served it with the same Lord and they served sacrificially. The same was, he called them my co-worker. Paul uses this title many times in the New Testament when he referred to people who were closest to him in sharing the gospel. You know, there's a special bond, a deep admiration and respect that incurs when you work with somebody towards a common goal, especially when you accomplish what you set out to do together. So he was his co-worker. And then the third was my fellow soldier. Well, this was an ex exceptionally important Roman title. Why? Because it was used in a military situation when a person in the highest command was reaching down to a lower ranking officer and bringing them up to the same rank as themselves. And from the Greek stratios, where we get the word strategist, 
Paul is literally saying Epaphroditus is his fellow commander in the fight for the gospel. This shows both Paul's gracious humility as well as Epaphroditus' great courage to battle the spiritual and political forces right there with Paul the whole way. The next thing is he calls him your messenger, the Greek apostolos, the same as apostle, which is an ambassador. This is not the same as the uppercase A, apostle. Uh, those were called by Jesus himself. But Epaphroditus, he is an apostle of the Philippians, uh, for the Philippians, and he's doing this because he's Paul's apostle, and he brings Paul's message, which is the message of the good news of Jesus Christ. And Epaphroditus was sent to bring him money, his, his great needs. He also calls him, your minister to my needs. You know, it's interesting, he calls him a minister, much like a pastor or a caretaker. But for Paul, who was also the pastor and the caretaker to the Philippians, you know, Paul's not one really to use these titles, these seats of authority that he has for his own gain. He's constantly actually handing out authority to others around him. He's constantly inviting people to step into positions of leadership just like him. And as we read on, we really catch a glimpse of how intensely Epaphroditus loved and cared for the Philippians. In verse 26, he says that he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Actually, that was verse 30 there, I think. That's interesting. What did Paul just say? Epaphroditus was sick, but he's not concerned for himself. Rather, he's actually more distressed for his friends who aren't sick. You know, that same word is used in Matthew 26, 38, when Jesus was praying and he's literally sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. This was an intense longing for his friends. It's amazing. Epaphroditus was certainly ill and he almost died, but God had mercy on him. And not only on Epaphroditus, but also on Paul, as it says in the scriptures, to spare me the sorrow upon sorrow, Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So Paul was distressed because Epaphroditus was distressed because he heard that the Philippians were distressed. Do you see what's happening? There is a sense where they are all carrying each other's burdens. They're all in sync. They're of one heart and mind. And there's something about this distress. It's not a, a kind of distress that's killing them. It's not one that's uh, a curse. It's actually one that is somehow God using to draw them closer and knit their hearts together as one. And this is what happens when we share one another's bonds and burdens. We're fulfilling the law of Christ. This, this doesn't mean that we should just go around feeling terrible all the time. What it means is that we share our lives, we share our hearts, we share our mission with one another, and we are concerned for one another. And out of that concern, there is a sense of strengthening. There's a sense of camaraderie. It's a sense of, of joined uh, mutual submission out of love. Jesus, Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, this, each one of them was on the same team and they were rooting for each other. And it was all pouring out onto the Philippian Christians. And it's such a beautiful picture of, of this idea of how we should order our homes, how we should order our families, you know, how we should order the way uh, uh, husbands and wives and children, as well as pastors and deacons and, and, um, and, and servants in it within the church. It, it goes into the every aspect, every sphere of life, this idea of setting aside um, my needs first, and to seeking out with love how to build up one another. This is, this is a beautiful picture of a community. And really, we see it all started by Jesus on the cross. From the cross to the grave and back again from the dead. This is how we can experience that resurrection life too. Let's turn to the Lord now and close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for the foundation that we have in you and in your love, that is by grace we've been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, not as a result of good deeds, so that no one should boast. Lord, we lean into you, Lord, and not just into your suffering, but into your joy as well. 
not just into your death, but into your resurrection. We pray now, Lord, for the, the brokenness, Lord, we see in the foundations of the families and of the communities and of our nation and of the world. And we ask now, Lord, that you would invite us to bear one another's burdens and to enter into this joyful uh, synergy and unity, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. We pray for healing and health and strength in your name, Jesus. Amen.